You're about to meet some busy people as we travel down these back roads of Montana. On a fiber farm in Ulm, it takes a lot of effort to turn this into this. Well, you could say it's almost an, an addiction. But <laughs> At a tea room in Anaconda, the cookies are soft, but not the work ethic. <laughs> we uh, play hard, work hard. And that's kind of been the philosophy around here. In Fromberg, we'll meet a woman who's fascinated with the lives of people she'll never meet. They should be immortalized, I guess you could say. Even this little bar has an interesting sideline. And chasing butterflies in Florence has never been more captivating. All from our location at the Nine Pipes Museum, just south of Ronan. On this episode of Backroads, we'll keep things buzzing. Backroads of Montana was made possible by the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communications on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. By Travel Montana at visitmt.com, and by the University of Montana, where the discovery continues. Well, it's beautiful with spacious skies, has amber waves of green. And has purple mountains majestic that rise up out of the plains. And all across America, from sea to shining sea, where the mountains and the prairies meet, is a place I need to be. Home is where Montana is, Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, to places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble, yes, I'm bound to roam. And when I'm in off the road now, boys, Montana is my home. Hello, I'm William Marcus. Welcome to the Backroads of Montana, a program about the fascinating places and interesting people found throughout the Treasure State. Today, we're in the beautiful Mission Valley, just south of Ronan, at the Nine Pipes Museum of Early Montana. By museum standards, it's fairly new, having opened in 1997 and is often overlooked by motorists as they sail past on their way to Flathead Lake or Glacier Park. But founders Bud and Laurel Chef have incorporated a distinct personal touch into their museum that makes it a must-see. This is a family museum. Five generations of the Chef family have devoted their time and talent to this museum. Guests are often greeted at the door by Bud Chef Sr. Bud, tell me a bit about your roots in the community. Well, William, I was born just a few miles away from here, from this spot, just up toward the mountain. And I've raised my family here, and my, my parents came here in the late 1800s, and some of, some of my relations came here before that time. My family is all raised here, and they're all interested in the museum, and they, they all have some work in it, and they like to help in it. And I think that they're all going to stay right close by and help us, and, I, and we're proud of them. Well, that's great. We're glad that you could join us today for the show. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The first story in our show today takes us to a small town south of Great Falls, where a woman has a hobby that ties together a farm, the animals, and the land where they all live. When Jan Johnson weaves, she feels connected. Something that feels fulfilling, like I'm accomplishing something that I enjoy doing. Her weaving project may not seem connected in the beginning. Hundreds of pieces of yarn, each strand separated from the next, each with its own history. The first strand started next to this bend in the Missouri River. This land has a family farm history that goes back three generations. Jan's grandparents bought the property back in 1918. It's a place that would later provide adventure for a five-year-old girl. My first memory was when my brothers put me on this little Welsh pony that we had and took me out uh, a ways from the house and then the barn was back there and then they left and so here I <laughs> was on this pony and he of course ran all the way back to the barn at you know, a gallop. Jan was on the move. She briefly left the farm but returned in the 1980s. Jan and her husband were each busy with a full-time job when they noticed the weeds getting out of hand on the farm. 
for a natural solution, they decided to buy some Angora goats. That's when another strand in the pattern walked in. Each time they needed to shear a goat, it produced about five pounds of fiber. It became clear they needed to do something with all that fleece. Jan's husband, Jean, suggested spinning and weaving, an interesting idea, considering he had one small problem with the animals. Now, I'm allergic to them. That's why I'm coughing. How's baby doing? Hi. Luckily, Jan had a better connection to their barnyard family. She added more strands of fiber to the collection. Alpacas. Let's go. <laughs> several breeds of sheep. Angora rabbits. Where's my face? Soon there was fiber everywhere. This was Jan's new connection to farm life. She followed the fiber into a new passion. After taking classes, Jan learned to spin it into yarn. The spinning especially for me is a real calming thing. Your thoughts are like 100 miles away and you just, you know, are sitting there with yourself and your thoughts and, and this yarn going through your fingers and it's just really soothing. These pieces of fiber led to connections Jan never imagined. A friendship with Linda Henning and her daughter, Bryce. They share the art of spinning. It's a chance to sit and visit. Jan frequently goes to festivals and fairs to meet even more people. Her fiber routinely brings home blue ribbon prizes. And it's that fiber that forges the closest connection of all. I can usually identify whose fleece I'm working with and, um, you know, it's kind of like a tangible reminder of, of the animal, you know, when you have a piece of things woven or spun out of them. So you can say, yeah, this is Sophie's blanket, you know, because it came from Sophie or, you know, whatever. So it's, it's pretty, it's kind of a neat feeling. This is Coco Pelli. She's a two-year-old alpaca female. Here's a shawl that was made out of alpaca, out of Coco Pelli's yarn. And it's a star design. It's one of many creations from Jan's loom, from the alpaca fiber to the Shetland mohair blend, scarves, blankets. Sometimes Jan uses natural dyes from plants found on the farm. They help create these vivid colors. Never fails to amaze me. I go off chuckling quietly to myself when I see some of the stuff she weaves, <laughs> how it evolved to where it is now today. Even though it's just a hobby, Jan has sold her work all over the world. She's been working with fiber for more than 16 years, and it's provided links to people and places far away. But it's home on the farm, that special place that provides the basics for Jan's creativity. It's kind of sort of a tie to when people really had to survive with the things that, that they made. And it's, I think it's neat, and it is a tie to the land and, and all of the the place, this neat place that we live. It's something that can clothe people and it's a natural way of, of uh, producing things for people. So I think it's a, a necessary part of life on earth. The farm, the animals, the fiber, it all ends up back on the loom. Each strand and its history pulled together by one person. For Jan Johnson, all those strands have a natural connection. You can see more of Jan's work each summer at the Montana Fair in Great Falls or at the Big Sky Fiber Festival in western Montana. The Nine Pipes Museum specializes in artifacts, exhibits, and photographs which portray the history and culture of the Flathead Reservation and of early Montana. A favorite stop for any tour group is this life-size Indian encampment. The diorama includes a real creek, children playing traditional games, and a woman scraping hides while native plants and medicinal herbs dry on wooden racks. In Anaconda, we visited a quaint tea shop in a century-old building. We made sure we got there on Tuesday because that's cookie day. Rose Nyman has been making chocolate chip cookies this way for 13 years. It's her Tuesday morning ritual at Rose's Tea Room in downtown Anaconda. And I use 
three um, different types of chips. I use two sizes on the chocolate. Rose is in early to bake her five dozen cookies, and every one has to be just right. I think this part takes longer than mixing them. <laughs> this is what's nice, you just load it and go. No one will ever say I came in because it's cookie day, but it's cookie day. <laughs> Let's see, there's a miniature. Once the cookies are done, the Anaconda native also prepares salad, sandwiches, and generally gets everything ready for what she hopes will be a rush for lunch. I keep a day count on this board. This is the number of actual work days, 3,721. When people start to arrive, Rose greets just about everyone by name. Oh, good to see you. Hi, How are you? I'm good. How are you? How's your mom? Oh. Same as ever. Incredible. She's going 90 to what now? Five. Oh my word. Okay, do you I need fresh cream? She takes everyone's order and moves quickly to get lunch served. No hired help here. It's all Rose. It's that work ethic that helped save this building from demolition. The historic Davidson building was originally built in 1896, but almost didn't live to see its centennial. It had been neglected for years before Rose and her partners, who run the business next door, bid on the building. It was a huge cleanup project, but I came from a generation where you look around, you find a corner, and you just start. They've spent a lot of money and a lot of hours of hard work, making it, once again, a showplace for Anaconda. I think it was the first time in my life I was able to reflect my personality there are some people that are intimidated by this, and whenever I hear that from a guy, I just add more lace. <laughs> Filled with antiques and collectibles, Rose's tea room has a homey feel to it. It's just, it's unique. And uh, all of her antiques, and it's just, it's a nice place to come. She's a real optimist, um, how she contributes to the community, to the state, to the individuals. She is an amazing person. Very good. And because it's Tuesday, every customer gets a chocolate chip cookie. The only tea served today was iced tea due to record high temperatures this autumn in Anaconda. It's really good. And it's but warm. that doesn't matter. It's the friendly service and the connection to the community that keep people coming back to Rose's Tea Room. Great. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Sometimes I feel like I work in Camelot. It's just and it's not all roses, pardon the pun, but um, it just averages out and it comes out to feel nice. Rose's customers are fond of bringing in cups and saucers that naturally bear the likeness of a rose. It's their way of saying thank you for all she still means to their community. The Chef family calls this part of the Nine Pipes Museum the Hall of Photographs. One wall depicts the struggle of pioneer life and the romance of cowboy culture. This photograph is of Laurel Chef's grandfather, who drove a stage in eastern Montana. The opposite wall celebrates American Indian life throughout Montana and features the family of Aeneas Conco. They were especially close to the Chef family. Bud, will you tell me about this photograph? That, that photograph there is of Aeneas Conco and he was in younger life when he represented the tribe and he was sent to Washington, D.C. on several occasions to represent the tribe on, on their businesses. This museum is full of thousands of, of stories that could be told if people would only listen and knew them. There are thousands of stories here and thousands of stories across Montana that have been forgotten. In Fromberg, we met a woman who's rediscovering some of those stories, one plot at a time. Even by boomtown standards, Jibo, Montana had a short life. The railroad only came as close as Fromberg. The brick factory suffered from an inadequate water supply. And the town's largest employer, the coal mine, was abandoned when higher grades of coal were found elsewhere. By 1912, most of Jibo's residents had moved out, dragging the town's buildings with them. All they left were a concrete bank vault and about 200 of their fellow citizens, buried in the Jibo Cemetery. 
Over time, nature moved in and returned this hallowed ground to the rattlesnakes and jackrabbits. Distant relatives lost track of their loved ones in Jibo. But not the American Legion. Each Memorial Day, Local Post 71 continued to honor their dead. That's how Melody Kilwine got interested. You see the flag flying and the honor guard fires off their rifles and they echo off the hills. And it just kind of touches you, it tugs at your heartstrings a little bit. Melody, along with her husband Mike, propped up fallen headstones, straightened borders, and kept the cows out. More importantly, Melody began keeping records and collecting information on the people buried in Jibo. One thing led to another, and the next thing I know, I just keep compiling all this information. And um, it's just blossomed into a historical research of this. Melody learned that the cemetery was established around 1899 with the burial of five-year-old Leela Natty Harlan. Leela's father, editor of the local newspaper, called the Jibo Cemetery the silent city of the future. Like Leela Harlan, roughly half the population of this silent city are infants, victims of childhood diseases or hardships common to a tough mining town. Felix Masson was 12 when a sandbank collapsed on him. He was already working as a weeder in the beet fields below Jibo. Opal Gottschalk's life ended when she was three. Her father, the town barber, placed this wire monument above her grave with the beautiful Clark's Fork Valley at her feet. 12-year-old George Pierce was on a sightseeing tour of the coal mine when he was electrocuted. He had just entered the mine when his hand touched the live wire and he was and he knocked, was knocked unconscious. unconscious. He lived for several minutes after the electricity had passed through his little body. Melody's ring binders describe how people died, but also how they lived. Folks called Washington Boyer Uncle Billy. He survived the Civil War, moved his family to Montana, and never missed a Legion meeting. Henry Curley went to Billings to have an infected arm treated. On the return trip, he became lightheaded, sat down on the railroad tracks, and was hit by a train. Ninety years ago, Carl Floor got drunk and attacked the town marshal with an iron bar. Marshal Billy Bartlett was struck several times before finally shooting Floor in self-defense. Today, only a few feet separate the two men. Plots at the Jibo Cemetery are free and no laws govern internment. That also means there's no tax money allocated for upkeep. According to Melody, that only adds to the appeal. You can do whatever you want. There's a lot of homemade markers up there. There are names cut into sheet metal or delicately carved in wood. This is another one of my unknown graves up here. There are simple concrete markers adorned with bits of colored glass. George Yoakum's granite cross is next to one fashioned from an old water pipe. Conrad Segmiller makes these crosses for family members only. His relatives, the Heisers, like many who settled in this valley, were of German-Russian descent. Some families couldn't afford a headstone. Emily Parrott has two, this one in Jibo and another 10 miles away in Rockvale. Why she has a headstone in Jibo is my mystery. Why? Wind and rain have not been kind to the sandstone markers. Neither have some people. Theodore Glott founded the town of Immigrant, but returned to Jibo. Last year, hunters used the cross atop his headstone to sight in their rifles. Melody says she can fix that. She can't fix one of her favorites. Little Alberto Coronado was the son of migrant workers. Vandals busted the simple headstone his parents made to retrieve four marbles. You know, they're not just a headstone. Um, they're, they're actually somebody's relatives. Disheartening setbacks haven't dampened Melody's enthusiasm or her curiosity. If she's not busy compiling information for her binders, she'll be up on the hill caring for the men and women and children buried in this silent city.
a community where she and Mike may someday take up residence. I guess, yeah. It's a nice place to be buried because it's um, so down to earth and it's quiet. Every now and then a train will come through and you hear the whistle. As a boom town, not much of Jibo, Montana remains. Thanks to Melody, the stories of those left behind will live on. Let's go home. Incidentally, my Aunt Genevieve and Uncle Frank are buried in the Jibo Cemetery. Uncle Frank was the local banker, and Aunt Jen was a former teacher and active in the church. Just down the hill from the Jibo Cemetery is the town of Fromberg. There, our backroads crew relaxed in one of the area's unofficial museums. Its archivist serves up a refreshing brand of local history. Meet Shirley Smith, curator of... The Little Cowboy Bar and Museum. This is, to my knowledge, the only cowboy museum and bar in the state. And everybody is welcome, of course, of drinking age. And if they got little ones, they can bring them in and look too. But they can't drink. Whatever their <laughs> age, patrons enjoy a lively display of Western artifacts and memorabilia. Lariats, hats, and saddles cram every corner. The walls are thick with early photographs of ranchers and homesteaders and newspaper accounts of reluctant outlaws like Earl Durand, inaccurately known as the Tarzan of the Tetons. Well, I've been a pack rat all my life. Everything I see and like, I keep. And it's, nothing is any good unless you can share it. But along with a little bit of history, something larger fills the narrow back room, a whole lot of Shirley's heart. I was married to a cowboy. I've got a cat named Cowboy, and I've got a bar named Cowboy. I do love the cowboy way of life. Two world-famous rodeo dynasties dominate the museum, the Linderman family, and the family of Ben Packsaddle Greeno. All were fearless men and women who made a living atop the meanest stock on four legs. Anything with more than four legs might be found in the natural history section. Yeah, I've got a critter corner back here, and it's got mostly varmints from this uh, neck of the woods. I've got beetles, I've got spiders, I've got a Jerusalem cricket, and the kids love them. So while the famous, the infamous, and the long forgotten collect a fine layer of dust in the back room, history buffs out front still enjoy the coldest beer in Fromberg. And for Shirley Smith, proprietor of the Little Cowboy Bar and Museum, all of them are special. These are my favorite people. People that come here, I don't think I've met a person I didn't like. Somebody else used that word, line once, too. In 2001, Shirley was crowned Ms. Senior Montana and represented us at the Ms. Senior America competition in Las Vegas. Our location today, the Nine Pipes Museum of Early Montana, is filled with bright colors and patterns. It's in the artwork and in the exquisitely beaded moccasins and cuffs, or in this parfait envelope used to store and carry dried meat. It's waterproof and mouseproof, and even after 110 years, its colors from natural plant and mineral dyes are still vibrant. And colors and patterns fill our final story, Montana has one of the most diverse butterfly populations in the United States. We caught a small glimpse when naturalist Byron Weber took us on a hike in western Montana. When you think of all the habitats that we have around here, it's not surprising. You have mountain habitats, you have higher plateaus, you have this wonderful prairie uh, grass that we have in eastern Montana. We have badland countries, sagebrush. We have alpine countries. So it's not surprising that we have 212 species of butterfly in the state. Byron Weber has been interested in butterflies his whole life, but only in the last decade has he seriously pursued it. He's worked with groups all over the state recording and observing butterflies. With a net made of fine mesh and an appropriate pair of tweezers, he showed us the swallowtail butterfly's proboscis. Uncoiled, it acts like a straw for butterflies to drink the nectar plants produce. This painted lady butterfly searches for nectar and shows that knapweed is good for something in Montana. As we continued our hike, we came across one of the few butterflies you can find in every county of the state. It's called the morning cloak, 
named because its dark colors resemble a cloak worn during a time of grieving or mourning. In 2001, it was officially named the state butterfly of Montana. The mourning cloak is the one I certainly would have picked. It's easy to recognize. There's really only two colors. There's just a light streak on the outside and, and the rest of it is pretty dark. It also comes out in the first warm days of spring, which means that it hibernated as an adult. So I like it because it stays here in Montana in the wintertime. It doesn't migrate. To get started observing butterflies, Byron recommended exploring in your own backyard. There could be opportunities to watch a caterpillar mature into a butterfly. But out on the trail, you never know what you might see. We found this tree with a fresh flow of sap. It created a feeding frenzy for these hornets, but there were butterflies trying to join in. This red admiral butterfly is flashing its colors to intimidate the hornets, but it's not working. Nearby, there is more butterfly diversity. A common wood nymph is searching for food. This zephyr angle wing seems perfectly camouflaged on a tree limb. All the while, the hornets continue to push back any butterfly advances. It's an exciting array of activities just outside our back doors. Butterflies, to me, uh, just paint this kind of idyllic state that uh, I appreciate. They just bring peacefulness to me. And the more I observe them, the more fascinated I am with them. Each year around the 4th of July, there's a butterfly count. It provides information on various species in the Northern Rocky Mountains. If you'd like to volunteer, contact the North American Butterfly Association for information on a count near you. And that's our show. We'd like to thank Bud and Laurel Chef and Bud Chef Sr. of the Nine Pipes Museum of Early Montana. We shared the museum with a group of students from Box Elder. As they were getting on their bus to leave, they noticed two eagles circling overhead. If you have an idea for the Backroad Show, contact us at the Backroads of Montana, the University of Montana, Missoula, Montana, 59812. And remember, as long as you keep watching, we'll keep covering the back roads of Montana. I'm William Marcus. See you next time. Backroads of Montana was made possible by the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communications on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. By Travel Montana at visitmt.com. And by the University of Montana, where the discovery continues. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, from places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble, yes, I'm bound to roam. And when I'm in off the road now, boys, Montana is my home. Coming in off the road now, boys, you know I'm heading home.